Hello again, students. Um, this is the final section of the acid base unit. Um, we're going to be looking at specifically a new class of definition of acids and bases, particularly called Lewis acidity. It was explained by the chemist G.N. Lewis in 1923. And what is it exactly is that a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor and a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. OK, so if you have a lone pair of electrons, for example, like what you see over here, um, that is able to be donated to something that it can accept that electron pair. What happens when we get a reaction is we find that we get something called an adduct. OK, there's the word adduct. And this is what it looks like. So you have the acid um, and the base, and we form the, the adduct. Um, by definition, most of the Bronsted acids and bases that we um, have learned about already exhibit Lewis acidity and basicity. It's just that this definition is a little broader. And something very important to note is that a proton is not necessary at all when we are looking at Lewis acids and bases. So what kind of possibilities exist? Well, um, we have, first off, a, a molecule that doesn't have a complete octet. So if we were to follow, follow Lewis structure rules, we know that some exceptions occur. One of them is we get incomplete octets for some uh, elements of the periodic table. One of them is boron. OK, so the example that's given on this slide is the boron complex that you see down here uh, reacting with ammonia. Now, you'll know that ammonia has its lone pair of electrons over there, and that can donate to the boron such that the octet of the boron becomes full and complete and is no longer incomplete. And this species over here would be the adduct. OK, in terms of bonding, how does this work? Well, we need to use our molecular orbital theory because we've explained in the past that the uh, polyatomic materials are best explained using molecular orbital theory. So a very generalized picture appears on the right hand side of your slide here where we have the acid on the left, the base on the right, and the complex in the middle. And remember the terms that I explained to you. I said uh, we get something called a LUMO, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And we get something called a HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital. And if we draw the simple molecular orbital diagram like you see um, on the right hand side there, this lone pair of electrons here is able to go into the um, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the complex. And that's essentially how uh, Lewis acidity works when we have complexes or adducts with uh, or species starting off with incomplete uh, oct octets. The second possibility that we have is that a metal cation, particularly the transition elements, they can accept an electron pair supplied by the base in a coordination compound. Now we're going to look specifically at coordination chemistry later on in Unit 7, which is Chapter 7 of the textbook. But the reason that this happens is because the transition elements have the d orbitals available, and some of those d orbitals may be empty in which case an electron pair can go into the d orbitals to maybe complete an octet or just fill up one of the orbitals. The third possibility that we have is a molecule or an ion with a complete octet can possibly rearrange its valence electrons and accept an additional electron pair. So the example that's given here is with carbon dioxide. Okay, so if you look at the bottom here, carbon dioxide 
and the hydroxide ion and what we end up forming here is the carbonate anion, the carbonate ion, all right? Um, and what happens here is that the carbon is able to just rearrange its valence electrons such that over here it has a valency a complete octet um, over here. Let me just mark it for you. And over here as well, it also has a complete octet. Okay, so it, all it did was rearranged its geometry. This is entirely possible. The fourth possibility is those species which are able to expand their valence shells. Okay, so these are the ones where we have expanded octets being possible. And the examples are given on the slide there of um, silicon tetrafluoride reacting with two fluoride ions to form silicon hexafluoride. Um, it'll be worth your while to go and do example 4.7 and self-test 4.7 in the textbook. <clears throat> Let's take a look now at some of the group characteristics of Lewis acids. If we start off with group one, the S block elements, the alkali metal ions tend to act as Lewis acids with, when they react with water and they form hydrated ions. So, for example, we know that sodium reacts with water to give us sodium hydroxide. Um, and what happens is that the water is able to donate its lone pairs of electrons to the sodium because of the uh, orbitals that are available for such things. And we find that we are able to label the metal ion as being a Lewis acid and the water as being a Lewis base. There is one exception to this in that the alkali metal fluorides tend to act as Lewis bases. If we go to group 13, which is um, the group that contains boron at the top, the ability of the boron trihalides to act as Lewis bases, sorry, acids, generally increases in the, in the order that's given. So we first have um, boron trifluoride, then boron trichloride, then boron tribromide. The aluminium halides are found to be dimeric. What does that mean? They form dimers, which means they join together and they're used as catalysts in solution. So we see this. Um, on the left-hand side at the bottom here, you will see what happens with boron. And this picture on the right-hand side here, you will see the ability of um, aluminium to be used as a catalyst. We'll be dealing with catalysis later on in Unit 8. And the shape of the diagram that you see here will become a lot uh, clearer. Group 14, which contains and starts with carbon. Um, these, all of the elements in group 14, except for carbon, will exhibit hypervalence, which means they have the ability to expand their octet. They will act as Lewis acids by becoming five or six coordinate structures. And for example, tin 2 chloride can both act as a Lewis acid and a Lewis base. Um, all right, in this case, in this example here with the silicon tetrafluoride, this is the Lewis acid, this is, is the Lewis base, and you end up with the adduct over here. Okay, so where the octet of the silicon has been expanded. Okay, if we go to group 15, the oxides and halides of the heavier elements will tend to act as Lewis acids, um, where in this case, the example is with antimony. Antimony um, pentafluoride can react with HF to give us this antimony hexafluoride ion plus this unusual cation over here. Group 16 also forms adducts. Um, sulfur dioxide can act as a Lewis, ace, a base, sorry, Lewis acid. 
by accepting an electron pair at the sulfur atom. And it can also act as a Lewis base where the sulfur dioxide molecule can donate either its um, lone pairs on the sulfur or on the oxygen to, to another Lewis acid. And then finally, group 17, we find that bromide and iodide act as very mild Lewis acids. And um, the picture that you're seeing on the um, um, bottom of the screen here uh, shows a polyatomic molecule, which I don't expect you to remember, but um, you can see that we can take a bromine molecule, uh, the valence electrons, and uh, an oxygen molecule here, and we can form the adduct where the molecular orbital diagram looks something like the one in the center that I've just um, highlighted for you. Okay, now how do we classify Lewis acids? Lewis acids and bases are classified as either being hard or soft, and that depends on their polarizability. So hard acids are going to tend to bind to hard bases and soft acids will tend to bind to soft bases. So for example, the hard acids and uh, bond in a specific order. So this is the uh, increasing order for uh, bonding with hard acids and soft acids will bond in this order here. Um, with regards to the previous slide, you need to remember those rules. Okay. And in regarding the classification of Lewis acids and bases with respect to anions and cations, um, you need to know this table very well. Okay. So the, this table shows a classification of the hard acids and bases on the left, the borderline acids and bases in the middle, and the soft acids and bases on the right hand side. And remember the rule that hard acids bond with hard bases, soft acids bond with soft bases. Okay, uh, the table on this side just shows the log of the e equilibrium constant against the iron and it shows the hard species on the left and the soft species on the right. Other contributions to complex formation. Um, it, it, sometimes what happens is you get competition with the solvent in the reactions. I've, I've mentioned this before, where the solvent will affect um, how fast reactions take place. We also get rearrangement of the substituents of the acid and bases. And often, particularly with very large uh, Lewis bases where uh, they are able to donate an electron pair, sometimes you get steric repulsion because they are big and bulky and they can't always fit into where they need to go. So you sometimes find that that is a problem. Finally, we can calculate some thermodynamic acidity parameters um, to see whether a Lewis acid and Lewis base interaction is actually favorable. Uh, we have something called the drago weyland equation. Looks something like this for this particular reaction. We know from our first year of physical chemistry that you're able to determine the delta H of this particular type of reaction. There's a specific formula, there it is, that's the drago weyland equation. And um, in order to calculate the delta H value for that particular reaction, we're going to need these values here. And they will come up in a table giving the drago weyland parameters. And of course, you can simply plug the values into the equation and you'll be able to calculate the delta H value. Then, to determine whether the reaction is favorable, you need to recall your previous knowledge from physical chemistry one. Remembering that a negative delta H value 
is a favorable reaction because we know that a negative value for delta H indicates an exothermic reaction and a positive value indicates an endothermic reaction. So that essentially concludes our section on acids and bases. I would encourage you to work through as many of the exercises and problems of both chapters that you can. Um, we're going to move on to Unit 5 from this point, and I will give some further instructions later on today as to how you should complete Unit 4.